my, 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 I'm excited about this program. This is called, wait for it, Flight to Pella, Cruise to Greenland, and the End of the World. I like that. I hope you like that too. I like it so much, I'm just going to say it again. <laughs> Flight to Pella, Cruise to Greenland, and the end of the world. What could this guy be talking about? Well, church historians, serious Christian students of biblical prophecy, and at least one Jewish guy on a cruise to Greenland know a few things about an otherwise little known event that happened just days prior to the total destruction of Jerusalem in 70 AD. The event, if you haven't heard of it, is known as the Flight to Pella. Even casual Christians understand that Jesus foretold the horrific scorched earth destruction of the temple in Jerusalem by the Romans. The well-known prophecy can be read in the 13th chapter of the Gospel of Mark. And I love the way the text launches out. Jesus was with his disciples at the temple and one unnamed fellow in the posse of the Messiah tried to impress Jesus. He said, look, teacher, what massive stones, what magnificent buildings. The disciple had clearly struck a note with Jesus, but not the note for which he'd aimed. Instead of a response acknowledging the beauty of the most glorious building in Jerusalem, Jesus took the opportunity to foretell its destruction. I was reading this text and making these notes in my journal. Well, I happened to be on a cruise to Greenland. It was a trip for our 50th wedding anniversary, and I wanted to take my bride someplace very different. And as I sat there reading the Bible, I came across these words of Jesus. He said, do you see all these great buildings, replied Jesus. Not one stone here will be left on another. Every one will be thrown down. It definitely sucked all the air and any remaining misplaced pride in the edifice out of the room. I can only assume when the disciples huddled up, they all agreed Epic fail. Don't try to impress Jesus. Later, four of the fellows sat down with Jesus on the nearby Mount of Olives to better flesh out what Jesus had meant. Peter, James, John, and Andrew asked Jesus, Tell us when will these things happen and what will be the sign that they are about to be fulfilled? Well, we can all be glad that the one unnamed disciple asked the provocative question that triggered Jesus. For it is in the detailed explanation that Jesus shared with his four friends that we learn about the foretold Roman invasion. And depending on your view of theology and dispensationalism, the end of the world. You interested in the end of the world? When I hear about wars and rumors of wars, I can't escape reflecting on the words of Jesus about the end he predicted. The news often report on invasions, armed conflicts, angry, violent protests boiling over into what some call revolts. Our world often seems to be brewing deadly revolutions birthed in resistance to oppression drastic inequalities and systemic political and economic chaos. The planet even seems to revolt with earthquakes, famines, and plagues. We read about them, we hear about them. Some folks experience 
aspects of these disasters. What did Jesus say? He told his disciples, and they've reported it for us. When we see such things, quote, do not be troubled, for such things must happen. I guess when I hear the news about these catastrophes in other places, it's easier to not be troubled. But what of those people living and dying in the middle of those such things that must happen? For many of them, it is the end. Now, whether man-made or catastrophes far beyond man's ability to control, manufacture, or manipulate, when horrifying tragedies happen, it is often the end for those suffering at the epicenter of the catastrophe. And they see such events differently than those less impacted or perhaps unaffected. And this is the reality surrounding the circumstances that led to the little-known flight to Pella. And I think you should know a little more about it and become aware. Jesus told the disciples, when you see Jerusalem surrounded by armies, then know those who are in Judea flee to the mountains. Let those who are in the midst of her depart. And a few decades, a mere few decades later, it's not that very long span of the time, Israel revolted against Rome in the era around 66 A.D. By 70 A.D., Rome had crushed the opposition and completely annihilated the capital city of Jerusalem. As foretold by Jesus, not a stone of the magnificent Jewish temple remained intact. But what became of the Christians? That is a question historians have debated for centuries. Now, obviously, the church, primarily inhabited by Jews who had come to faith in Jesus, endured. But have you ever asked yourself, how? What, what happened? Some had lived outside of Jerusalem, where the worst devastation was experienced. Some had already begun carrying the message of the gospel beyond Jerusalem into Judea, Samaria, and to the uttermost parts of the earth. But those who heeded the prophetic warnings of Jesus may have been spared simply because they believed and they obeyed. It is widely believed that a group of Jewish Christians recognized the circumstances. The Roman army was closing in on Jerusalem. Desolation was near they acted on the clear warning foretold by Jesus. They got out of Dodge while they were still able. The broadly held view was that they fled to the place known as Pella. It's across the Jordan River in the foothills of the Transjordanian Mountains. Pella would have been in the area known as the Decapolis. This tradition has been believed and communicated by ancient church historians since the 4th century. I've written about the flight to Pella in books that I've published about the various early sects of Jews and Jewish Christians. I've had an interest in this topic, even though I guess most folks have never heard of the flight to Pella. But you're hearing about it here, and I want to make sure that you have an opportunity to consider some of the facts and perhaps even some of the conjecture. The point here is that the Gospels recorded the warning of Jesus, and many of his earliest Jewish followers understood his message. Was their instruction to head for the hills when they saw Rome close in for the kill? Two leading ancient sources of information about this flight to Pella include Eusebius of Caesarea, who was the most famous church historian, and Epiphanius. 
after the Roman storm had resided, eventually those Christians who had survived the onslaught by evacuating Jerusalem would have been able to come out of hiding. Unfortunately, little is known with certainty. Bits and pieces of history point us to this conclusion, and Pella remains an open question. The end does too. Reading the end-time prophecy of Jesus in context is crucial. Christians from the time of the apostles until now interpret it in different ways. Both Mark and Luke report the prophecy. It's an extremely foundational text for students of end-time prophecy. So please allow me to read it. I want you to hear the words of Jesus. And maybe we'll talk about it. I'm going to read from the New International Version, Luke chapter 21. I'll start at verse 7. Teacher, they asked, when will these things happen? I think many of us are asking that question too. And what will be the sign that they are about to take place? This remains the question on so many of our minds as we hear the news. He replied, Watch out that you're not deceived. For many will come in my name claiming I am he, and the time is near. Do not follow them. When you hear of wars and uprisings, do not be frightened. It's interesting that the world has been reporting false messiahs for generations. The Jews have had numerous false messiahs. Those who adhere to false religions have been opened to the claims of false messiahs. Do not follow them is what Jesus told us. When you hear of wars and uprisings, do not be frightened. We hear of wars and uprisings. They abound. These things must happen first, but the end will not come right away. Then he said to them, nation will rise against nation, kingdom against kingdom. There will be great earthquakes, famines and pestilences in various places and fearful events and great signs from heaven. But before all this, they will seize you and persecute you. They will hand you over to synagogues and put you in prison and you will be brought before kings and governors and all on account of my name. So you will bear testimony to me. Whether you realize it or not, those things are happening. People who hate the gospel, who hate the God of Israel, perhaps they hate Israel. They hate the Bible. They hate Christians and they hate Jews. People are being arrested. Go to India. Ask in the north how many pastors have been imprisoned. Hundreds of churches have been burned. Hundreds, hundreds demolished schools, Christian schools, seminaries, church buildings, Christian-owned homes. Tens of thousands have been forced to flee as refugees because they believe in Jesus. On account of my name, those of us who carry the name of Christ, we need to be aware that some are hated because of his name. And so you will bear testimony to me, but make up your mind not to worry beforehand how you will defend yourselves. You will be betrayed even by parents, brothers and sisters, relatives and friends, and they will put some of you to death. Everyone will hate you because of me. That time is coming. I don't think it's fully here, but I think we're seeing the birth pains. But Jesus says, not a hair of your head will perish. I think we're going to have hair in heaven. Mm. He said, stand firm and you will win life. When you see Jerusalem being surrounded by armies, 
you will know that its desolation is near. Those who likely left in their flight to Pella heard these words, knew the message that Jesus had declared and saw with their own eyes the Roman army surrounding Jerusalem. You will know that its desolation is near. Then let those who are in Judea flee to the mountains. Let those in the city get out. Let those in the country not enter the city. For this is the time of punishment and fulfillment of all that has been written. Ah, what does all this have to do with Greenland. <laughs> I'm going to tell you. <laughs> I recently had the privilege of visiting this predominantly barren nation. Greenland is huge. Did you know Greenland is more than three times the size of Texas? Greenland is bigger than the entire nation of Mexico. But only 56,000 people live on the world's largest island. So I can tell you that there's not many people there to share the gospel with. It's hard to find people. There are very few churches. As I was sailing away from Greenland, an impenetrable dense fog fell on us. I looked out the window and I couldn't even see the water. It's not very far from the end of the boat <laughs> to the water. I couldn't see it. The fog caused me to think about what I was reading in a different light. I was studying the prophecy about the end as described by Jesus. Now, of course, those Christians who lived during Roman military invasion, when they were there, when the army was coming in, it was brought on by a Jewish revolt. And those people who lived then and there, particularly those Christians who lived then and there, would have interpreted the words of Jesus as having been fulfilled in their lifetime. And they would have been correct. Those Christians who saw the invasion unfold and fled to Pella would have also been correct in their interpretation, which likely saved their lives. And when I read that prophecy and interpret it in light of headline news today, I feel like the end is in sight. When I talk to my friends in foreign countries where Jesus is hated and the gospel is outlawed or next door to outlawed, it seems like the end is near. And I think it is. But really some things are hidden in a thick fog. The thing about a dense fog is that one loses a responsible sense of depth and direction. Fog is disorienting. When you can't see the water, you can't see the sky, you can only guess what's ahead. You may have a recollection of what went before you or where you've been, but you can't see it. It's all guesswork. If you can't see 10 feet ahead, you certainly can't see 10 days or 10 years, or 10 generations. I'm sure that the Jewish leaders who initiated the failed revolt against Rome had assumed that things would end differently. Military experts often speak of the fog of war. Perhaps in that fog, they believed they could throw off the shackles of Roman oppression. They could win their freedom their independence forever. But when that fog of war cleared, all that remained was utter destruction. Those who had interpreted the prophecy of Jesus correctly for them at that time were prepared to carry on 
after the fog cleared. I cannot claim to have the Bible prophecy decoder ring. More successful writers and preachers may have the better answers or the best guesses. What I see is a storm on the horizon. I don't know what you see, but I think if you're paying attention, if your radar's on, you see the same storm. Sometimes storms hit fast and without adequate warning. At other times, they roll in slowly, powerfully, and with unmistakable signs. I think Jesus told the truth of a coming disaster to his first century followers so they could prepare. They couldn't see what we are seeing today of that same prophecy unfolding before our eyes. We can't see what they saw when Rome was preparing to demolish our temple and overturn every stone of that edifice. The words of Jesus cut through the fog in 70 AD. The same words are still cutting through to show us the path to safe haven through the coming storm. Will we pay attention? Many of us have driven through storms. We've seen torrential downpours that blot out our vision. Sometimes you need to hide under a bridge or an overpass just to see the front of your car. It's often then that it feels that the storm is unending. Yet in general, storms do pass. If we make good decisions in the storm, chances are good that life will go on after the storm. But while we are being blinded by the storm that seems infinite, we can't see ahead. We can't see behind. And we have no idea what lies down the road. We may have a recollection of where we've been. We have a hope of where we're going. But the only thing we can know with certainty is we're in a storm. If we've learned to trust the Lord, we'll remember that the storms have come and gone and He's brought us through. If we've walked with the Lord, He's proven Himself faithful and we can recall what He's done and give thanks and look forward to what He will yet do. When we can't see ahead, looking back on God's previous faithfulness can be very comforting. It can also help us avoid making bad decisions in a weak moment. Jesus foretold the future for us. We have perfect clarity about some of the things He assured us would happen. We see other things through a glass darkly. I'd like to clear it all up. I'd like to see the entire fog over the future lift, but that's not the way we see the future. Without a fully functioning flux capacitator or a crystal ball, you can't go back to tomorrow. We can't talk to those Christian Jews who fled to Pella before Rome lit the fires and burned down Jerusalem. We can't know how many valleys lie between the mountaintops or how many smaller ranges will need to be crossed if we only see the tall peaks in the distance. Bible prophecy is often that way. We don't know if the massive ice fields of Greenland will recede or expand. And if you're in a storm right now, I can't tell you when or how it ends. But I know if our trust is in Jesus, He will provide a perfect eternal rest. And when the end comes, He will be there just as He promised. And the end of the world will surely come just as He has foretold. Not surprisingly, the end of the fog on our cruise to Greenland came first, I'm very happy to say. And as the fog cleared from my window, I knew I couldn't be positive which pieces of the prophecy had happened before, never to happen again, and which ones were happening again to draw us closer to God as the coming day approaches when the final chapter unfolds and we meet Him after our last breath. 
or we meet him in the air at our first breath of eternity. So until then, I want to remain in his word and continue telling a lost world that Jesus is coming because he said he would, and I believe what he said. For those of you who are paying attention to things in the world and you have concerns about where things are and the scope of Bible prophecy and the soon coming return of our Messiah, I want to read you just a few more of his words from the Gospel of Luke. Even so, when you see these things happening, you know that the kingdom of God is near. Those words should be very comforting. There is something coming, and it's good. There may be some bad things between here and there, but at the end, it's good. The kingdom of God is near. Truly, I tell you, this generation will certainly not pass away until all these things have happened. Heaven and earth will pass away, but my words will never pass away. There's no question here but that these words were intended for us because this has not yet happened. There still is time. And Jesus warned and comforted us. He said, be careful or your hearts will be weighed down with carousing, drunkenness, and the anxieties of life and that day will close on you suddenly like a trap. Don't let that happen. For it will come on all those who live on the face of the whole earth. Be always on the watch and pray that you may be able to escape all that is about to happen and that you may be able to stand before the Son of Man. This is for us. God wants us to stand. He wants us to have faith. He wants us to be prepared. He wants us to be ready. He doesn't want us to be caught off guard. He wants us to pay attention. My prayer is that each of us will seek the Lord. He will be found and He will hold us he will shelter us. He will comfort us. He will take us to himself because he is coming for us. Till next time, Shalom.